you are British or any other nationality and have been watching Wimbledon and don't usually watch tennis, these next few weeks could be some of the most important of your life. Maybe. <laughs> Welcome back to the tennis vlog. So Wimbledon has been and gone the biggest fortnight of the tennis season during which we usually pick up a few more tennis fans, generally from Britain, sometimes from elsewhere as well. The hardcore tennis following is joined by several hundred thousand more people who are not so hardcore and they join us for Wimbledon which is great, and then they depart. Honestly, you do not know what you are missing out on if you don't follow tennis year round. Even if it is just so you can come to Wimbledon next year and be more informed about the sport, have more of a background knowledge on the players competing, know what's gone on in the previous months, it is worth watching tennis throughout the year or at least keeping up with what's been going on which is what I aim to help you do with this channel and I do encourage you to watch tennis throughout the year. So I'm back to restart our roundup and preview videos. The idea of these videos is I will round up the previous week on the professional tennis tours and then we move on and we generally take a brief look at the week which is to come. So today is a bit different. I am away with no Wi-Fi next week, therefore I will not be able to do a roundup and preview video at the beginning of next week. I will be back to do one the week after. And we've just come away from a two week tennis tournament. So it makes sense now to round up the previous fortnight, which is Wimbledon, and to preview the coming fortnights. Except we are part way through the first week of that fortnight, meaning that I won't so much be previewing this week as next week if that makes sense. So let's get to rounding up the third Grand Slam of the season. WTA player of the tournament was Garbinier Muguruza, who was ranked world number 15 as she won the Wimbledon title, defeating Venus Williams 7-5-6 love for her second Grand Slam trophy overall. Now hopefully many of you watching will have also seen my preview and predictions video for this match, which contains quite a bit of background detail for both players how they progressed through the tournament, what challenges were facing them. If you haven't checked that out, you might want to do it now. In that preview and predictions video, I called Venus Williams to win the match and therefore her eighth Grand Slam title in three sets. Do I regret making that prediction? Even though she lost the match, I actually don't think I do. Venus is 37. She's overcome so much in her career, illness, injury, people dragging her down. And she has started to bring her best tennis to the Grand Slams again. And my reasoning behind her possibly losing in the final to Mikarutha was simply not being able to handle the enormity of the occasion after so long away from this stage. But given that she performed so well throughout the fortnight, I didn't think it was fair to say that she would crumble and therefore I made the prediction that she would come through. As it happened mentally, it was too much for Venus in the end, but she held two set points in the opening set of her encounter with Muguruza at 5-4 on the return and I do believe that had she taken either of those two points it would have given her breathing space, she would have been able to relax a bit and clearly at points in the first set she was hitting double faults, she was a bit tight, she wasn't relaxed and that would have loosened her up and honestly I think the whole results could have been different but she didn't win that game and she didn't win another game after she lost that opportunity. I think she invested so much emotionally and physically and mentally in that game and in the entirety of the first set trying to win it that it was just too big a blow for her to take when she lost it and in the second set she did just fade but you have to give 100% credit to Muguruza. After Roland Garros last season, her first Grand Slam win, Muguruza went on a really poor run of form after she'd looked so promising. She'd won her first Grand Slam title at the age of 22. Was that so unexpected? In the grand scheme of things, I don't think so. She'd stood out since she was a teenager because she had strong mentality. She wasn't intimidated by big players and big stages. In fact, they seemed to bring the best out of her. 
However, when she went into that French Open tournament, she wasn't in good form. She managed to scrape through the early rounds, and then it's in the latter stages of major tournaments that she brings her best tennis. I didn't ever think she was going to back up that win straight away, plainly because her form was so shaky going into the tournament, and I do feel that hurts Muguruza. However, she has got back to the steady climbing of the ladder with her win at Wimbledon. From the first round, she looked mentally in the right place, really concentrated, very aggressive. Her game, which she's modelled on Serena's, very precise and really attacking tennis, is made to excel on all surfaces. She made the Wimbledon final in 2015, and this tournament she just showed what she could do. She was pushed once very hard by Angelique Kerber in round four. Kerber was the top seed, and Mikarutha was teetering on the edge there, but she showed mental resolve to hang tough and come through that. Definitely what Mugarutha proved at Wimbledon was that she has the mindset and the mentality for the big moments and the big stages. She brought her best tennis at the end of the tournament when she thrashed Magdalena Rybarakova in the semi-finals and then absolutely nailed her spots while Venus was clearly fading and did not let up all the way through that final. So... Credit to Mikarutha, and the question now is whether she can learn from the experience of that first Grand Slam and the aftermath of it and really beat the players she should be beating in the coming weeks. ATP player of the tournament is Roger Federer, who won his eighth Wimbledon title in defeating number seven seed Marin Cilic 6-3, 6-1, 6-4 to claim his record 19th Grand Slam title. People say of Federer's victory that it was a foregone conclusion, but that should not take away from how brilliant the run was. This time last season, Federer crashed out in the semi-finals of Wimbledon, injured to Milos Raonic, and promptly took a break from the sport for six months. Even if you're not familiar with tennis, you probably know the story. Federer had been chasing an 18th Grand Slam title since 2012, came very close in 2014 and 2015 where he pushed Djokovic in the Wimbledon final, didn't quite get across the line, and that was, I think, harmful mentally to him, detrimental, especially when he had another shot at Djokovic in the 2015 US Open final. I think those close calls against this particular player provided a stumbling block for him. And Djokovic himself was just playing brilliant tennis at that point in time. But Federer returned to tennis in January with no pressure on his shoulders and flew to triumph in Melbourne at the Australian Open. And that is a result that gave him so much confidence as we saw in the ensuing months as he went on to win all the big titles on offer. Then he skipped the entire clay court season for fear of getting injured and to be ready and in his best state for the grass courts. And he was, and he got it right, and he's Wimbledon champion. After getting through his first round via retirement, Federer simply did not let up. He looked efficient all events. He was playing in another league, basically. Was it his most impressive run in terms of caliber of opponents to a major title? No, it wasn't. Federer didn't actually face a single opponent ranked inside the top five on his way to the title. However, you have to look at what the rest of the tour was offering. Rafael Nadal was always his biggest challenge given the form Nadal was in and he was on the opposite half of the draw. The toughest opponent he could have faced in his own half was Novak Djokovic who came into the event on shaky form and he still ended up against his projected opponents in round four and the quarterfinals. In round four he took it to former semi-finalist Grigor Dimitrov. In the quarterfinals he hammered Milos Raonic, the number six seed, in a rematch of that clash that caused him so much pain last season. And in the semi-finals he faced a really tough task in Thomas Verdic, who was going for his shots with no fear and who was really nailing his serve. Marin Cilic could have made the final more interesting. He held match points over Federer here last year. He has a massive, massive serve, biting ground strokes. And it was tough to watch in the final because Cilic had a burst blister on his foot that was causing him pain. He didn't feel in a 100% condition to give Federer a run for his money, really. The first few games of the match, Cilic was like a machine absolutely so precise, so aggressive, pushing Federer back 
and it did look as if they were in for a really long battle. But Federer did get the break of serve in the first set before Cilic began to show signs of being physically unfit. He hung on, waited for his moment and pounced when the opportunity was there and then he kept it together to steamroll through the rest of the set and effectively through the rest of the match. When you're playing an injured opponent it can be hard to stay focused, to get it done, especially for Federer in the setting of a Wimbledon final where he'd had had opportunities in previous years and not being able to get it done there must have been so many emotions and thoughts playing around in his head so to be able to serve it out and close it out the way he did with an ace down the t-line is impressive as are all Federer's accomplishments to date this season. Match of the tournament has to be Gilles Muller's epic upset of Rafael Nadal in five sets in the quarterfinals. 6-3, 6-4, 3-6, 4-6, 15, 13. Muller was the number 16 seed at the time and Rafael Nadal seeded number four, but he was definitely in the top two of the players most in form during the fortnight. In the recent past, because of knee injuries and generally finding it hard to adjust to the surface, Nadal has really struggled on the lawns despite having two Wimbledon titles to his name from 2008 and 2010. But in his first three rounds, Nadal didn't have easy opponents in John Millman, Donald Young, Karen Kachanov, all of them notable names, and he didn't drop a single set. He was phenomenally aggressive. He really attacked the ball and was playing in as comfortable a way as if he were on his beloved dirt. You got the feeling that something might be different to the previous years where in some of them he had looked in good form and then he had come up against a zoning opponent just before the quarters and everything had fallen apart. And it happened again this year, just when Nadal was looking ready to go the distance, just when Roger Federer himself had said that Rafael Nadal was going to make the final, he loses in five sets. And the most amazing thing about that match was that at the end of the day, it didn't really have anything to do with Nadal playing badly. He did not produce his best tennis in the first two sets, as he said himself, but the fifth set was all about how Gilles Muller was bringing incredible precise serves and beautiful net play in the big moments. Nadal showed incredible tenacity and fight and drive to come back and make it two sets all and at that point looks like he could come away with victory but Muller despite having lost those last two sets he just hardened himself, focused on the occasion Every time Nadal came back and fought to level the scoreline when Muller had had match points or had held a really easy service game, he just got himself together and held another easy service game with big serves and attacking tennis, moving forward into the court, and it was incredible to watch both of them, Nadal's fight and Muller's absolute calm in the biggest and most monumental situation on a tennis court in his life. There was one point in that fifth set where it looks like Nadal might have the win and I think this is still going to hurt for him. He had break points, it was his third or fourth break point in the specific game and Muller hit a second serve Nadal returned it into the court, he'd been getting depth on those second serve returns and the ball was called out. Muller challenged and the ball was in, but there is a rule in tennis which says that if your second serve is called out but it's in, you get a first serve back. For Nadal that was a death blow because Muller had been landing bombs so of course he was going to come up with a bullet serve, now he'd been given a lifeline, which he did and credit to Muller, given that opportunity he did not look back, he rarely if ever looked in trouble on serve again after that moment. Absolute heartbreaker for Nadal who you feel would have held serve to close out the win if he'd broken at that point. But then again he did have other opportunities beforehand and didn't take them. But incredible poise from Muller to pull that one off. So moving on to ATP shock of the tournament we could easily go for Muller upsetting Nadal. However, maybe it is something we should have seen coming. Nadal has traditionally struggled against big servers and in recent history he has been fragile in the round of 16 at Wimbledon. So maybe bigger shocks included Sam Querrey's upset of Andy Murray in the quarterfinals. Murray, the top seed, didn't come into Wimbledon in full fitness, however he 
went through his first rounds without any issues, he was playing everything down, he was fine. Where he is now known for his shock upset of Novak Djokovic in the third round here last season, which sparked a very unexpected and poor run of form for Djokovic. These things don't generally happen a second time, but there is something about Sam Querrey and Wimbledon now. In the third round, he was taken the distance by Joe Wilfred Songa, another player who has traditionally brought his best tennis to Wimbledon. And Querrey edged that one out, not just because of his gigantic serve, but because of his powerful and flat game off the ground, constantly finding the marks with his backhand especially, reading Songa's game really well, and after he'd backed up that victory and got a shot at Murray, it was an impressive upset. Was Murray playing his best tennis in the final two sets? Frankly, no, he wasn't. He lost them 6-1 and 6-1. That doesn't happen for Murray against a player of Quarry's caliber and ranking if he's playing his best defensive tennis. And especially after Query lost the third set tiebreak so badly, an upset didn't look incredibly likely, but it's a testament to Query's belief and mental focus that he came through that match. I'm not sure how much of an issue injury was for Murray. Clearly he wasn't moving as well in the latter stages, but you wonder if that was fatigue, other things as well. Generally, if he's injured, let's be honest, he's pretty dramatic and he wasn't clutching at anything or, I mean, he was staggering a bit, but he kind of staggers around anyway. Now it's always hard to pick a WTA shock of the tournament because the tour itself is so surprising in general. So there weren't major expectations for any particular woman moving into the tournament. In fact, things were so unpredictable that many were crowning Petra Kvitova the favourite for the title. Kvitova won Wimbledon in 2011 and 2014, but in December last year she suffered a knife attack at her home in the Czech Republic to her left hand, her playing hand. Doctors originally doubted whether she would even be able to return to a tennis court. Five months later, she was competing at the French Open, and in her very next tournament in Birmingham in June, she was raising a trophy. That was a premier level event. I never really expected Kvitova to win Wimbledon, largely because a lot of people were saying that she would, and generally how it goes on this tour, if someone's expected to go all the way, if they're not Serena Williams, they're probably not going to. So maybe Kvitova's loss to Madison Brengel in round two, in three sets, wasn't so shocking because Brengel was up in their head-to-head -head as well. A loss that really was a bit more of a shock was Karolina Pliskova's to Magdalena Rybarakova, the eventual semi-finalist, but also the world number 85. Rybarakova, we know, is a talented and unique grass court player, throws a lot of slice and unique shots into the court. Plish Kvitova as well has never gone deep at Wimbledon. In fact, it's easy to forget that she hadn't made a single breakout run at a major event until she reached the US Open final last season. But she has immensely flat and powerful ground strokes. She got to the semi-finals on the very slow clay of Paris in June. So if she could do well there, how much better could she do on the fast lawns of Wimbledon in London? apparently not better at all. Klishkova was on the brink of victory at a set to the good and five all in the second, and that she lost from that position is probably a bit concerning for her. Maybe it's a consolation that Rybarakova went as far as she did, but she was eventually thrashed by Muguruza 6-1, 6-1 in the semis. For a world number one with as yet no Grand Slam titles to her name, Pliskova is going to be looking for much better than a second round showing at a major in her future. Okay, that's Wimbledon rounded up. Now for the quickest preview of a fortnight you have ever seen. I'm going to make extra sure that those of you who are new, who maybe have only watched Wimbledon, can follow along with tennis if you so wish. So we have the two tennis tours, ATP, WTA. Each season lasts from approximately January through to November. The players tour around the globe, competing in different tournaments. Three surfaces are played on during the year. Hard courts, clay courts, grass courts. And the season is split up into different sections. The first 
section of the season from January through to end of March is played on hard courts. The second section of the season from beginning of April through to beginning of June is played on clay courts. From beginning of June through to beginning of July, tennis is played on grass courts. And from around about the stage we are now at, so end of July through to the culmination of the year, tennis is played on hard courts. So naturally, as the final hard court swing of the season begins, we're moving on to clay courts and grass courts. This is all the fault of the unbalanced tennis calendar which gives grass courts a minuscule amount of the season and clay courts not much more. So there are random tournaments that are kind of thrown into the calendar wherever they can fit. So as we move from grass courts onto hard courts which round out the year, there are two or three weeks where players are all over the place, some are playing on dirt, some are playing on grass, some have gone to hard courts already. And this is the period of time which we are now in. I call it the crossover period. So this week there have been five tournaments going on, three on the men's ATP tour and two on the women's WTA tour. For the men, UMAG is being played on clay, Newport on grass and Bastad on clay. And for the women, Bucharest is on clay and Gestad is also on clay. And then before I tell you anything else, we have to go through the standard of events. Both tours have four Grand Slams. They are the highest level of tournament in tennis. You cannot get better than winning a Grand Slam. If we were making a pyramid out of the level of events, which I will do now for your benefit, the Grand Slams go at the top. Then for men and women, it's a bit different. At the top of the ATP pyramid, we have the Grand Slams. Then there are a certain amount of tournaments during the year spanning all surfaces, apart from grass, which are ATP Masters 1000 series events. So this is the caliber of tournament below Grand Slam. Then it goes down to ATP 500, then it goes down to ATP 250, which is the amount of ranking points you get if you win the event. Over on the more complicated WTA tour, Grand Slams are the most prestigious event, and then we have a few more tiers of events than we would in the ATP. So we have Premier Mandatory, which is the women's equivalent of ATP Masters 1000. If you are a top player, you are required to compete at this kind of event unless you are injured or pregnant or ill or if you can come up with another excuse because you really don't want to play in one of the best events in the world, then you can skip. So it goes Grand Slam, Premier Mandatory, then simply Premier, next level down is Premier 5, next level down is International, which is equivalent to an ATP 250. All tournaments played this week were either 250 events for the men or International events for the women. Next week we have five more tournaments, which I will explain to you now. For the men we have tournaments in Hamburg on clay, hard courts in Atlanta and clay again in Gestad. And on the women's tour we have a tournament on clay in Bastad and on hard courts in Nanchang. So for these next couple of weeks the most notable tournament is Hamburg which is the only tournament played that isn't either an ATP 250 or a WTA International. Hamburg is a 500 event. All the top players, Andy Murray, Rafael Nadal, Roger Federer, Novak Djokovic, most of the top 10, you are not going to see in action until partway through August when two Masters 1000 slash Premier Mandatory events begin in America, Cincinnati and Canada, Montreal, Toronto. However, the events next week and this week, if you're keeping in touch with tennis, they are certainly worth watching. In Hamburg, the top seed is currently supposed to be Pablo Carreño Busta, who upset Milos Raonic at the French Open, a tournament also played on clay. He will be joined by Albert Ramos Vinolas, who made a decent run at Wimbledon and is also more efficient on clay courts. And Feliciano Lopez, a Spanish lefty, and Richard Gasquet, a talented Frenchman, will also be in the draw there. So thank you once again for joining me and for watching. As you can see, the light has faded. Thank you to everyone who joined with me during Wimbledon, everyone who subscribed. Please subscribe if you haven't, please share the video if you enjoyed it, and please keep coming back for more content. As I said, I won't be here next week, but I will be back with new content the week after. And yeah, thank you for taking the time to listen to me ramble. See you next time. Thank you.